Hi everyone and welcome to this, our third instalment of remote learning from Brighouse High School's PE department. Today's topic is going to be focusing on guidance and feedback in sport. So, before we get into this, it's important that we understand what the difference is between guidance and feedback. Guidance relates to information that we give to an individual in order to aid either the learning or the development of a skill. And as we can see here, we have a baseball coach giving some information to an individual about the batting elements of baseball. Feedback is different because feedback relates to the quality of the skill or the performance that's just happened. And as we can see here, a football coach has given some feedback to one of his players on the performance that he's just observed. So we're going to focus on guidance first and foremost, and hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to do quite a number of things. You'll be able to identify and explain the four different types of guidance we use. You can then talk about the advantages and disadvantages of using them uh, in different sports. And then you can also apply that knowledge and suggest which type of guidance you think would be best used depending on the sport or the athlete who you're trying to guide. So, as we said, guidance in sport is information that you give to somebody in order to aid the learning and development of a skill. We have four types of guidance, visual, verbal, mechanical, and manual. Easy to remember, VV, MM. What we do need to do, however, is ensure that we understand what each one means. And we're gonna use this task here. As you can see down the left-hand side, we have the different types of guidance, and down the right-hand side, we have the different definitions. What I'd like you to do in a moment is just to pause the video and to see if you can match up the type of guidance with the correct definition. You can pause the video now. Okay, hopefully you've completed that task and we're now gonna see how well that you did. So, starting with the top one then, visual guidance. Visual guidance involves somebody showing an image, a video, or even demonstrating the skill you want the performer to replicate. Verbal guidance is describing the skill that you want the performer to demonstrate. Manual guidance is providing physical support to assist the performer when they are learning or developing the skill. And mechanical guidance is using equipment to assist the performer when they are learning or developing the skill. So hopefully you can gauge how well you did in that task there. So moving on, hopefully this slide here will just embed that understanding a little bit more. So as you said, visual guidance is showing somebody what you want them to do. And that could be through an image, a video, or demonstrating. Here you can see the tennis coach here demonstrating what he wants his learner to do. Verbal guidance is telling somebody. And as you can see in this, def, uh, this image here, we have the coach verbally explaining to her player what she would like them to do. Manual guidance is providing that physical hands-on support. And here we can see two coaches supporting a young gymnast in executing the skill. And lastly, we have mechanical guidance, which is using equipment, external equipment, to support the performer. And here we can see a young swimmer using a flotation device to assist them. Obviously, with mechanical guidance, that could be anything relating to rugby, where they use tackle pads, something of that nature, American football, where they also use tackle shields as well, anything external in order to assist the performer in learning or developing that skill. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages of using different types of guidance, and we're going to take a quick look at these now. So, visual guidance are particularly useful for beginners. Beginners like to watch what they are expected to do so that they can simply copy it. And vision is most people's dominant sense, watching something. And each aspect of the skill can be shown repeatedly to aid understanding. So again, if we use the tennis player, that coach could keep repeating the same skill and just explaining this, I was, this is what I want you to do. Just keep doing the same thing over and over again. So hopefully that they can observe that and then replicate it. However, there are disadvantages to visual guidance because it does rely on the demonstration or the video or whatever the learners watching being of high quality. It's also only effective if the learner is paying attention and some skills are too complex to simply watch 
and then expect the learner to copy. If we use something more complex like a double somersault, say, on a trampoline, it would be difficult to simply do a double somersault and expect a beginner to get on and do exactly the same just because they've seen you do it. Verbal guidance, so telling a learner what you want to do, is more suitable to advanced performers. This is because you can use specific technical language. And obviously, if you use technical language on a beginner, then this can sometimes be sensory overload. They're not understanding what you want them to do. And then that doesn't lead to them learning the skill. Um, but equally, it can also be given before, during and after the skill is performed. So that guidance can happen all the way through. The negative aspects to this, not only the sensory overload, sometimes complex skills are often too difficult to explain. Um, so if you can imagine trying to explain to somebody how to do a Cruyff turn could be sound quite technical, whereas just doing a Cruyff turn, demonstrating it visually, is much easier to take on board. It can become quite boring for the performer if you're just listening repeatedly to the same thing being told to you. And if you are given that verbal guidance during the performance, it can distract them. And I'm sure you've all been in the same situation when you're doing a skill drill, whereas a coach is telling you what to do and it can become distracting. Manual guidance. So it's particularly useful for beginners because they feel safe and they feel supported as they learn the skill. And it allows them to get a good feel for it before attempting it on their own. The negative aspects for that, though, is that a performer can begin to rely too heavily on that support. And to some extent, not all skills can be learned in this way um, because some performers may feel uncomfortable being physically guided, guided and it could become detrimental to them. Mechanical guidance is particularly useful for skills or sports that have a high risk attached to them. And it uses or it is used to build performance in the performer because it allows complex or dangerous skills to be learned without the fear of injury occurring. Obviously, we've got somebody learning to swim here. Using a float gives them that sense of confidence. But you could also use something along the lines of uh, a tackle pad in rugby. Learning to tackle a tackle pad before tackling a live attacker will give you that sense of confidence and safety. However, similarly to to manual guidance, it can uh, ensure that the performer relies too heavily on this and then without it, they can't really perform the skill. And it can also give overconfidence, which could lead to injury. And in some cases, the equipment that you need for mechanical guidance can be expensive. So it doesn't necessarily suit all particular skills. So that's the recap on guidance. Hopefully you can take that and put that into context with what we were trying to achieve at the start of the lesson and we're now going to move on to feedback so feedback today similar to guidance there's four different types of feedback that i want you to learn i want you to be able to describe the key features involved in the different types of feedback and analyze different types of feedback for various sporting examples and why some types of feedback are used more than others so feedback the difference between this and guidance is that feedback is all about the quality of the performance, okay, based on what has just been observed. Four different types of feedback. We have intrinsic, extrinsic, concurrent, and terminal. So, similar to what we did before, you've got your four different types of feedback, <clears throat> excuse me, and you've got your four different definitions. What I'd like you to do now is go ahead and see if you can link the definition with the different type of feedback. You can stop the video now. <clears throat> Hopefully, you've all completed that task, and we'll now take a look at which definition links to the correct feedback. So, intrinsic feedback is feedback from within the body, and it relates to how a movement feels for the athlete. Extrinsic feedback is the opposite to that. This is all feedback from external sources from outside the body relating to how successful the skill or performance was. Concurrent feedback is feedback which is given during the performance. Hopefully the word current in there will give you some clues to that. And terminal feedback is feedback which is given at the end of a performance once it has been completed or finished. So. Intrinsic feedback, as we said, is all based on 
how the athlete feels that movement. And we get that feeling from something in the body called proprioceptors. It can also be known as kinesthetic feel, and it's mostly used by experienced athletes who know what it should feel like. Um, so something like uh, a tennis serve or a golf swing or a rugby tackle. The athlete can feel that they've performed it well. Um, some people can often say that as soon as they hit the ball, they knew where it was going to go. And that would be intrinsic feedback. Extrinsic is the opposite to this. So it's anything that comes from the body externally. Usually given verbally or visually, it comes from a coach, a manager, a teammate. It can even come from the fans, clapping, applauding, saying well done. Or it can even come from winning a medal. If you win a gold medal at the Olympics, you clearly know that you've performed well. And it informs them on what went well and potentially what they could improve on. This is just a quick example of how intrinsic and extrinsic feedback usually work well together. It's very rare that you would just use one and not the other. They usually come hand in hand. So here we have a long jump athlete. The intrinsic feedback that they potentially would use are all these things that are coming up now. So feeling how fast they're running. Have they got the correct stride length? Can they feel the wind in their face? Have they hit the takeoff point correctly? The flight of the jump, does it feel like it's going where it should do? And then the feel of the landing. All of those things are coming from inside the athlete without anybody telling them otherwise. The extrinsic feedback to add on to that then would be, does the takeoff flag go up? Was it a legal jump or not? Did the crowd applaud or weren't they too happy with it? The distance that was actually measured, the coach's feedback, where did they position in the event? Were they first, second, third, or were they down towards the bottom? And then potentially doing some video analysis after each jump. All of those things extrinsically came from outside of the body. Concurrent and terminal feedback then. So as we said, concurrent, the word current, it happens, feedback happens during the performance. It can be both intrinsic and extrinsic. So the feeling you get inside and the external feedback you're getting from coaches. And the benefit to this is that you can make immediate changes. So it could be um, a group of teammates getting together as that rugby pitcher shows saying, right, we need to probably change this over the next 10 minutes. Or it could be a coach speaking to you during a break in play saying, right, we're going to change this. We're going to change the formation. The negative aspects of that, though, is that it could make you lose focus because if you're getting so much feedback during the performance, it can make you lose focus of what's important. The opposite to that is terminal feedback. So the feedback comes at the end of the performance. It usually comes from an extrinsic source, such as a coach, um, and it allows the athlete to focus during the performance. So you're not getting loads of information given to you while you're performing. It allows you to take that information on once a break happens. That could be at half time or it could be at full time. The disadvantage to that, however, is that you can't make those immediate changes. And those changes could have inevitably improved your performance. So if a coach waits to give you that feedback at the very end of a game, you could have said, actually, well, if I'd known that 10 minutes in, I could have made those changes. But obviously, there's pros and cons to each one of those. So that's our topic on guidance and feedback. Hopefully, this is a little checklist for you to be able to do. So for both guidance and feedback, can you identify the four different types of guidance, visual, verbal, manual, mechanical, the four different types of feedback, intrinsic, extrinsic, concurrent and terminal? Can you describe the different types of guidance and feedback and can you give examples of these? Can you discuss the advantages and disadvantages of guidance? And can you discuss which types of feedback would be best suited to different athletes, beginners, advanced athletes? So as always, if you need any further help or assistance, then just drop us an email. But hopefully that will stand you in good stead and give you all the information that you need on guidance and feedback.